On April 24th, while hosting one of the highest rated programs on the channel, Tucker Carlson left Fox News. There was much celebration in left-wing spaces as one of the leading voices for far-right messaging was no longer going to have a platform on the most-watched cable news channel in the United States. But even in that moment, people did wonder aloud just who might be replacing Carlson in that coveted 8pm time slot. After several weeks of rotating hosts, we got that answer on June 26th. Jesse Waters would replace Tucker Carlson with his show, Jesse Waters Prime Time, moving to 8pm on July 17th. If you're not familiar with this guy, Jesse Waters has been working for Fox News for his entire professional life. He started off as a production assistant at Fox News after graduating from Trinity College with a BA in History in 2001. In 2003, he was brought on to The O'Reilly Factor, which would go on to be one of the top-rated shows for Fox. Waters would specialize in unexpectedly confronting interview subjects in public, often creating footage that was more spectacle than informative. This is the environment that shaped Waters throughout most of his professional life at Fox News, as he spent roughly 10 years working with O'Reilly. In 2014, Waters joined the Fox News show Outnumbered, though it was in 2015 where he really got to spread his wings as the star of Waters World, a monthly special and running segment on The O'Reilly Factor. In 2016, one segment garnered quite a bit of attention for ostensibly being about asking Chinese Americans in New York their opinions on politics all while asking culturally insensitive questions and engaging in East Asian stereotypes. <laughs> there was a lot of criticism that was directed towards Waters for this segment, though it didn't seem to affect his work in Fox News. This segment wasn't really that unique either. He would similarly have other segments asking cab drivers about immigration and mocking people at pride parades. The anatomy of these segments is pretty basic. Waters would go up to random people, ask them questions, and play whatever answers they get to make people look stupid, often splicing in footage of random TV shows and movies. It's a very old, tired technique. You can see variations of this technique used all over TV and YouTube. It doesn't have much value as a piece of journalism, but it does give an audience the opportunity to laugh at people they would dislike. Immigrants, people in the LGBT community, and liberals and leftists more broadly. Waters' world would go from a segment and monthly special to a regular weekly series in 2017. It would come to an end in January of 2022, but that's just because Jesse Waters was getting a new show. Waters' largest platform more recently was his role co-hosting The Five, which would eventually become Fox News' top show. Waters became one of the show's regular hosts, started in 2017. And while the makeup of The Five has changed over the years, right now it consists of Waters, Greg Gutfeld, Dana Perino, Janine Pirro, Harold Ford Jr., and Jessica Tarlov. Waters again courted controversy on the show for a number of remarks. Some of his more memorable ones include when he said Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wasn't ripe enough to become president. She's not ripe enough to run for president. First, <laughs> she has to get married. What are you she saying? has to plan a wedding. Or you want to plan a wedding and run for president at the same time? And he said that teachers are taking away gender from kids. Little kids are losing their gender because they get stuffed <laughs> in classrooms with grooming teachers. He also made this weird comment about how he can tell someone's immigration status just by looking at them. I saw on the way into work a illegal immigration family digging through the trash looking for recyclables. How did you know they were illegal? You can tell. And Jesse. I can tell. I'm a city guy, and you don't want me to get into it, but I can tell. Jesse's commentary on The Five, and his commentary more broadly, tends to follow this type of pattern, using provocative commentary that seems designed or to shock or entertain, depending on the audience. It usually doesn't have much in the way of serious analysis. On The Five, his voice is balanced out by the other hosts, but on his own program, Jesse Waters' Primetime, we can see how Waters stands on his own while under the biggest spotlight he's ever had. I should also mention that even though he has a primetime show, he is still also one of the hosts on The Five, so he's on two shows every weekday for Fox News. He's a pretty big deal over there. To see how Jesse Waters has been getting along, I watched the first two weeks of his show from its debut on July 17th, though I'm going to mostly focus on that first week as it's fairly representative of his work. I also watched a handful of episodes for the past year, and it's all pretty consistent in quality. And yes, this show has been on for over a year. In fact, it began airing on January 24th, 2022, as a replacement for the aforementioned Waters world. So what we're getting isn't a whole new show, but rather a time slot shift. Keep that in mind, as this shouldn't be seen as a show still trying to figure itself out in its early days, but rather an established entity trying to fill the big hole left by the departure of Tucker Carlson. 
Waters show is structured like most other cable news shows, a feature story that takes up the first 15 to 20 minutes, usually including a short interview. The next segment will run a bit shorter, maybe 5 to 10 minutes, and also typically has an interview. And then there are a barrage of quick stories and segments, often not lasting more than a minute or two. It's amazing how many segments they squeeze into this 40-minute program, usually getting 6 or 7 in each episode. And that's not counting the puff segments where Waters reads text messages he gets through the program, or goes on short rants about his dentist. No pain at all. He's the best dentist ever. I'm not going to tell you who she is, though, because I don't want to wait in line next time I go. For the sake of organizing the flurry of stories and segments from just one week of the program, I'm going to organize them into three categories. Real daily news, that is, the news of the day that is timely and relevant to the broader public. Boilerplate issue news, stories that individually don't mean much on their own but serve as evidence of a larger persistent issue in the news. And non-news stories, that have the appearance of news but are actually not reporting or commenting on anything of value. I also have a bonus category for stuff that was just weird and silly. These are segments I wanted to talk about, but could find a place for. One of the big problems facing cable news is its struggle to find enough news to fill a 24-hour schedule. That isn't to say there aren't things happening in the world that are newsworthy. There are plenty of stories to fill up 24 hours. The real challenge comes in finding stories that appeal to a wide audience. As I write this, there is a coup happening in Niger where there is an attempt to overthrow a democratically elected government. I don't expect the story to get more than a few mentions on Fox News at best, and I would be absolutely shocked if it was mentioned at all in Jesse Waters' prime time. In fact, in the two weeks I spent watching this program, it wasn't mentioned once. On the other hand, there was typically at least one story every night about Hunter Biden. This isn't just a Fox News problem, though. MSNBC and CNN have this same tendency to focus on stories that appeal to their audiences more so than any broader principle of news of the day. After all, these channels are designed to earn advertising revenue. And generally speaking, people are less interested in a government being overthrown in Niger than they are about cocaine being found in the White House. Which brings us to one of the few real news stories of the day that Waters covered on his program. Cocaine was found in the White House. On July 13th, the Secret Service announced it was closing the investigation into the small bag of cocaine found at the White House due to a lack of physical evidence. This was after it was sent for testing and no fingerprints or DNA could be recovered from it. That isn't to say the bag was untouched, rather it could easily mean there wasn't enough uncompromised traces to provide a useful piece of evidence. On his July 18th episode, Waters covered the story like this. The Biden White House just blew up the bag of cocaine. They destroyed all the DNA evidence because apparently when they went in and got the bag, they treated it as a biological entity and for some reason destroyed it. We're already off to a bad start here as this interview he's highlighting isn't actually new. It's from Friday, July 14th, four days before Waters' program aired on Tuesday. I guess this supposedly new development wasn't urgent enough for him to include it in his Monday show. Or maybe because it was from that obscure network known as Fox Business that perhaps he's not familiar with. It's actually standard police procedure to destroy drugs that aren't part of an active investigation or criminal trial. If no one has been charged, and the police have no evidence for an investigation, holding on to drugs takes up valuable space in an evidence locker. I'm sure they have records of the evidence, whether it be the test results or photographs or other things they can keep for longer storage, but they simply can't hold on to every piece of drugs they find. But what's more interesting here is how Waters frames this story and the only supposed path to truth now. The only way now we'll ever prove whose coke it was is if Hunter confesses. The only way to find out the truth is if Hunter Pyden confesses. This presupposes Hunter is the one who the drugs belong to. Waters supports this claim by saying that visitor security is so tight at the White House only a Biden family member could have brought it in. This wasn't a tourist. This was probably someone living at the White House. And we know recovering addicts living at the White House. Over 500 people work full-time at the White House, which Waters does mention later, but not in the clip I just showed you, because it's more important that he craft this narrative first before mentioning facts that are less convenient. It's easier to ignore something when a person already has the conclusion fed into their mind. Waters always places an emphasis on the facts that fuel the speculation he wants his audience to engage in, that this cocaine could only have belonged to Hunter Biden. With 500 people working at the White House, it's quite possible any one of them could have brought cocaine in there. And 500 people with probably very busy, intense jobs and likely coming from privileged households themselves, it's quite possible any one of them could have been doing cocaine. 
Did the Secret Service dust the cubby for prints? Or did they blow up the cubby also? And if you stash Coke in the cubby, wouldn't you want to cover it with something? Like, you know, put it in a backpack, put it in a book, maybe a pouch? Was there anything else inside the cubby? I hate to turn this into a basic class on journalism, but asking open-ended questions isn't journalism. It isn't even analysis. It's the classic conspiracy theory technique of just asking questions. And with the questions Waters is asking, he's already given away the game. These questions are designed to create a narrative in the mind of the viewers. Waters isn't going to answer them because he simply doesn't have the evidence to back them up, but none of the viewers at home are burdened with that responsibility. And if they need any nudges in that direction, Waters will make the relevant assumptions and make sure the questions lead toward a very specific conclusion. That is, only Hunter Biden could have left the cocaine in the White House. On July 19th, Jesse Waters had an update for a request his team made for footage from the White House about that cocaine in a locker. Last week, we asked for any and all surveillance footage relating to the coke bag found at the White House. But the Secret Service is telling us no. They're not releasing any tapes or documents. They're telling us releasing it would interfere with the investigation. But the Secret Service shut down the investigation last week. This isn't news. This is nothing. Saying you tried to get some evidence, but then didn't, is not a new development in the story. The subtext is that something fishy is supposedly happening here, of course without actually doing the very hard work of demonstrating or evidencing that something fishy is happening here. Waters also covered the very real story of former President Trump facing another indictment for his role in interfering with the 2020 election. It was presented like this. Well, it looks like Joe Biden's going to have Trump arrested. Again. The only real discussion of the charges here dismisses them offhand and frame the entire thing as Joe Biden trying to keep Trump occupied in court during the electoral campaign, something that's entirely conjecture and based on the idea that Biden is simply too infirm to campaign. Waters' evidence for this supposed strategy is this. And here's Joe Biden nearly falling asleep with the Israeli president. And we brought Israelis and Palestinians together at a political level, and they, uh, and, uh, and, at the, uh, and, and Aqua and Israel. This is particularly lazy, as these videos of Biden falling asleep at meetings have been circulated in the past, only to be revealed as being deceptively edited. In this case, it's a specific section of footage, where if you zoom in, you can see that Biden isn't falling asleep here, he's reading some notes he placed on his lap. And if you rewind the tape a little bit, you can see Biden putting those notes on his lap, which might have made it more noticeable he's not falling asleep. The rest of this segment is dedicated to dunking on CNN for how they're covering the story. CNN turned into TMZ and turned Jack Smith into Tom Cruise. Watch. Turns out even Jack Smith can't resist a $5 footlock. On the point about CNN, fair enough. Covering someone getting a sandwich on their lunch break is deeply silly and reveals how that channel struggles to fill its 24-hour schedule by wasting airtime talking about nonsense. But how did a story about the indictment of Donald Trump turn into a story dunking on CNN and hypothesizing that this is all part of Biden's electoral strategy? Probably because it's easier to mock a media outlet than doing some real investigation into the story itself. If they really wanted to defend former President Trump, they would dig into the details of the potential charges, or what little was known about them at the time of this episode, and undermine them with another set of facts or investigation. Instead of doing that, though, they pivoted away from the actual news to instead attack a perceived enemy. Jesse Waters' primetime is not built to handle breaking news. This is one of the major challenges for commentary programs in general. To provide interesting or insightful commentary, you often have to wait for a more complete picture of a news story to be revealed to really analyze it. But by jumping on breaking news, it leads to snap judgments that are more often guided by an agenda or ideology than the evidence itself. And that ultimately becomes what an audience is coming to see, reinforcement of a narrative more so than reporting on the news of the day. Jesse Waters tonight uses news as an impetus to push narratives, creating the illusion that people are being informed when really they're just being taught to think about something else when these news stories are brought up. So when someone mentions Trump is facing a third indictment, someone who watches Jesse Waters tonight is now armed with a talking point about CNN worshipping the lawyer helping bring charges against Trump by covering how he got a sub for lunch. That says nothing about the actual charges against former President Trump, but it does create the vague impression that the media and justice system are in cahoots to frame Donald Trump. 
This program isn't unique in that respect, though it is pretty brazen in how little regard it has for using evidence of any kind to support its narratives. It reminds me of a segment I saw on Tucker Carlson's program where he turned a cringy White House social media post for a surprise birthday party into some grand gesture demanding obedience from the people. It's like a room full of aliens have gathered to act out this concept they've just heard about called happiness. Harris suddenly yells surprise at her own surprise birthday party, like she's hosting the event for one of her multiple personalities. What the hell is going on here? Jesse Waters doesn't have that kind of heft to his commentary, though. He's not talking about the Democrats being in league with the powerful elites that are trying to control everything you do and end white people in America. He just sort of calls the Democrats corrupt, refers to them vaguely as the powers that be, and moves on from there. It's more toothless than the toxic stuff you would see coming from Tucker Carlson. Boilerplate stories are the ones that make up the bulk of Jesse Water Primetime's news coverage. While every story Waters comments on is tied to some kind of narrative, these are the stories that, if not for the narratives attached to them, likely wouldn't be covered as news. As a point of comparison, a former president being indicted is big news no matter what political decision you take. A former NBA player supporting trans people at an event is not a big news story, unless you want to weave it into a larger narrative regarding trans acceptance in the mainstream. This cuts in both directions, by the way. Whether you want to use this clear sign of trans acceptance going up as a good thing or a bad thing. Case in point, here's Jesse Waters covering that story on July 17th. Are you rednecks or who don't want to drink Bud Light? What happened to Sir Charles? The minute he signs with CNN, he turns into Don Lemon? Of course, some context is missing from that clip. Here are the part of Charles Barkley's comments that weren't included in the clip. Y'all can't cancel me. Hey, I ain't worried about getting canceled. Because let me tell you something, if y'all fire me and give me all that money, I'm gonna be playing golf every day. So listen, as I said last night, if you're gay, God bless you. If you're trans, God bless you. And if you have a problem with them, fuck you. Also, this is apparently something Charles Barkley does pretty regularly. If you're gay, bless you. And transgender, I love you. If you disagree, you. The Barkley non-story tumbles into another story about the live-action Snow White being more inclusive, which tumbles into an image of some performers using the washroom. This is how quickly Jesse Waters' primetime moves from subject to subject within the same segment. All of this eventually leads to an interview with an anti-trans activist. This new terminology was the language of female erasure that would be used to take away my own sex-based rights. All of these little stories and the quick interview are done within less than five minutes, and they all serve the same purpose. A generalized anti-LGBT, more specifically anti-trans, message. A popular narrative on the right, and Fox News specifically. These little stories don't say much of anything on their own, but the interview ties them to this narrative of some kind of coordinated effort that apparently Charles Barkley and Disney are working on together to trans everyone. These tiny pieces of information are merely meant to reaffirm something someone was convinced of a while before. None of these news stories are particularly newsworthy, but the narrative is all that matters here, which is why they found their way onto this supposed news program. It's a triumph of narrative over news. Another example of one of these boilerplate stories, and this was all over Fox News in general, was the supposed cancellation of the Jason Aldean song, Try That in a Small Town. And by cancelled, they mean not having his video played on the country music television channel. The story was worth segments on the 18th and 19th, even opening an episode where nearly 15 minutes was spent talking about it. Now they're trying to get the Grand Old Opry to cancel his shows. The fans aren't going to let that happen. They'll watch Al Dean play in a parking lot if they have to. His song just hit number one on iTunes. A more cynical reading of this, and one I ascribe to, is that this whole idea of getting cancelled is largely a marketing ploy. Jason Aldean has courted controversy in the past, and that's gotten him coverage in the mainstream press. Every time one of his controversial statements is in any way condemned, it's then flipped to make him some kind of martyr, endearing him to the audience that watches Fox News. It's obviously not a coincidence that 
After getting cancelled, Aldine's song hit number one on iTunes. The only thing even remotely interesting about this story is that Aldine's song includes the lyrics, cuss out a cop, spit in his face, stomp on the flag and light it up. Yeah, you think you're tough. We'll try that in a small town. See how far you make it down the road. First off, if you spit in a cop's face anywhere, big town or small town, that cop will almost certainly arrest you. But what's really interesting is that line about stomping or burning the flag. That's protected speech under the First Amendment. It's ironic for someone to cry censorship when their song includes a lyric about censoring the political speech of someone else. And based on the lyrics, it doesn't sound like he's after some kind of friendly conversation. And this Waters segment is an absolute joke when, in the very same episode, we see Waters complaining about the new live-action Snow White movie, insisting that they hire little people for the role of the Seven Dwarves. Were Seven Dwarves not diverse enough for Disney? Think about what's better, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves or Snow White and the Six Unemployed Dwarves? Disney has the artistic freedom to make any kind of movie they want. And Waters is free to criticize them, it just seems strange that when someone criticizes Jason Aldean it's considered censorship, but not when Waters criticizes Disney. These are the boilerplate stories that masquerade as news to push a narrative. And while these are trivial stories, the narratives they're attached create the danger. What's being fought over here is not the right to free expression, but the policing of what sort of speech is acceptable in public spaces. Contrasting these two stories can tell you a lot. When it comes to right-wing media, a music video being pulled is an attack on American values. When it comes to supposed left-wing media, it's an outside ideology infecting the population. And by left-wing, we're talking about the very mild inclusivity of a soulless Disney movie. So calling that left-wing is too generously adopting the right's framing. It's more like centrist liberal messaging. The idea here is to make even those centrist ideas appear far left and to police what sort of discourse is acceptable in popular culture. The easiest way to do that is to engage with anything deemed popular and using that to frame any part of it that is left to conservative as extreme. It both normalizes the right-wing position and makes any sort of centrist or left-wing position seem unthinkable. As much as we might want to ignore these stories, I do think it's important to acknowledge what they are. It's not just a dopey guy chasing ratings with a ginned up story about something from pop culture, although it is that too. It's also an attempt to fight off even the mildest form of non-conservative messaging and culture. It would be easy to ignore if millions of people weren't watching this and internalizing these messages. While we roll our eyes, people are mobilized on social media to harass actresses for daring to appear in certain movies. And again, this is about a version of Snow White that has fairly modest, centrist inclusivity. A true leftist Snow White would end with the prince abandoning the monarchy to join Snow White's multiracial polycule co-op where they live sustainably in harmony with nature, taking brief breaks to disseminate anti-monarchist literature to foment rebellion in the kingdom. And a media controlled by the left would let a bad country music slowly fade away into obscurity, because without the whole cancelling narrative, Everyone was happy to ignore this Jason Aldean song when it came out nearly two months ago, before the video was pulled. Although much of the supposed outrage coming from leftists is overblown on this program, there was at least one genuine piece of news that was upsetting. Blowback over Florida's updated school curriculum that included language instructing teachers to mention the benefits enslaved people got from slavery bringing a false sense of balance to what is an obviously hideous institution. Here's an interesting bit of gaslighting from Waters. Instruction includes how slaves developed skills which, in some instances, could be applied for their personal benefit. That's the section everyone's freaking out about. I always hesitate to use the term gaslighting because it's so overused, but in this case, I don't know how else to describe this. Let's put Waters' statement here on the screen and compare it to what he says just seconds later. No one is arguing slaves benefited from slavery. No one is saying that. It's not true. They're teaching how black people developed skills during slavery in some instances that could be applied for their own personal benefit. He says no one benefited from slavery and then says that enslaved people learn skills that they then benefited from. It's incredible that he thinks no one can see through this. The authors of this part of the curriculum defended their choice of words and offered a list of examples of supposed former enslaved people who used the skills they were forced to learn to their benefit. A Twitter user by the name of Alexander went through the list, one by one, highlighting how the majority of these examples cited were never enslaved. And in one case, one of the examples was George Washington's white sister. 
Here it is broken down in a handy chart. Of the 16 names cited, two of them, maybe, fit the criteria of someone formerly enslaved who used the skills learned while enslaved in their personal life afterwards. The two African-American academics who crafted this school curriculum don't appear to be the best choice for crafting a curriculum when their knowledge of history is so weak. But this is hardly a lesson worth learning at all. The lived reality for many of the people who were enslaved, the ones who were eventually freed and the many, many more who weren't, was not one where they acquired any sorts of skills of their own choosing. These were all forced on them so they could be exploited by people who owned them. When it comes to slavery or any sort of historic event, there are numerous facts that one could include or not include that help shape the impression of young students when it's taught in a school curriculum. Trying to evoke any kind of upside to slavery is a mockery of the horrors of that institution and brings with it a false sense of balance, as if this horrible period of history requires some kind of silver lining. So Waters isn't entirely wrong in this case when he says the left is outraged. A curriculum written by people ignorant of history trying to soften the impact of slavery to a generation of children in Florida is something worth getting angry about. The next group of stories I want to talk about that I noticed on Jesse Waters' primetime are the non-stories. These are stories that, once again, serve a narrative, but don't even have the tenuous link to that narrative that a low-stakes boilerplate story has. These are some of the most weak attempts to present a facsimile of news that's designed to feed into the fear and paranoia of the audience. Here's one example from the July 17th episode. It's about a federal grant of $16 million that is being used to help complete two trails in Connecticut. This grant is finishing a project that completes an 84-mile trail connecting the towns of Plainville and New Britain. Here's what that segment looked like. New Britain, Connecticut was given $17 million in infrastructure money from Joe Biden for an anti-racist hiking trail. Yes, this has somehow become an anti-racist hiking trail. But before we get to that, here are a few quick corrections. First off, it's two trails and not one that this money is for, and these trails are for more than hiking. One includes a public bus route that would need to be paved and staffed. Also, Waters said 17 million, but it's actually 16, something his employee gets right when he goes to speak to the people in New Britain. $16 million, you could take a hike in the woods. Does that sound right? It sounds actually quite boring. The anti-racist part is the confusing one. Looking at the official announcement, there's no mention of race at all. It's part of the Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity program, which is part of the Investing in America initiative, which does include a small section on racial equity being a priority. But this specific project? What would make it anti-racist? The best answer I could come up with is because the population of New Britain is nearly 62% non-white. In 2023, the Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity program gave out grants to 162 different projects, and the program has been around in some form since 2009. Also, this trail project was announced back in 2022. This is all an excuse to send this guy to a community of non-white people to get a few quick sound bites complaining about a project that's being inaccurately framed. This is all intercut with footage of goofy jokes to really hammer home how silly this should all sound, but this isn't news. It's an old story that's been trotted out to advance a tired narrative of Biden's infrastructure plan being bad. And since there are 161 other projects getting grants like these, among many others that are part of the broader initiative, an endless series of segments like these can be produced with no informational value whenever they need to fill some time. It does harken back to the earlier segments Jesse Waters did when he was working for Bill O'Reilly. None of these were really newsworthy either, but they made people laugh and generated anger towards the right people. My favorite non-story though comes from the July 20th episode where Waters reported on the discovery of an unclassified document that supposedly revealed everything about Hunter Biden's business dealings that they were not only true, but way worse than we realized with tapes of Joe Biden making threats and extorting people for millions of dollars. This document details that Joe and Hunter Biden coerced a Ukrainian CEO to bribe them $10 million. The document genuinely does say all those things. I read it myself. Although, crucially, it doesn't actually have direct evidence. It claims there are recordings and bank records that prove everything that's said within them. But the document itself is just saying that this evidence exists, not actually providing the evidence itself. I'll let you all know right now, I have no loyalty to the Biden family or the Biden administration. 
and it's honestly a bit annoying whenever I have to find myself defending them because it's important to explain how people like Jesse Waters lie about political stories all the time. If there were real evidence that crimes were committed by anyone in the Biden family or administration, they should absolutely be investigated. A scandal like this would be important front page news around the world, and rightfully so. No government official should ever be above the law. Though the reason this story is coming up so late in my video is probably similar to the reason even Jesse Waters didn't open his show with news of this document. It was mentioned in the second segment of that night's program, 12 minutes in, and he only spent about two minutes on the story. It reminds me of the old axiom, big, if true. The statements in this unclassified document come from an FD1023 form. A message from the FBI explains what type of information these forms contain. FD1023 is the form our special agents use to record raw, unverified reporting from confidential human sources, CHSs. FD1023s merely document that information. They do not reflect the conclusions of investigators based on a fuller context or understanding. Recording this information does not validate it, establish its credibility, or weigh it against other information known or developed by the FBI in our investigations. That unverified part is particularly crucial, especially since this document comes from 2020. Not included are any documents that reflect any investigation related to this information, including whether or not the evidence exists at all. None of this evidence has been presented anywhere. This raises a possibility that the informant who provided the information was either lying or mistaken about them existing. Without any additional information, there's really nothing to go on here other than some hearsay. In other words, until the document's information is verified, this is a non-story. Someone making a false statement to the FBI is not news. After dropping this bombshell on his July 21st episode, Jesse Waters decided to open his program with an update on the document. If the Ukrainians have 17 tapes of the Bidens talking bribes, plus bank records, and the President Biden has sent Ukraine billions of dollars for, quote, as long as it takes, you think the president's being blackmailed? Getting straight to the point, do these tapes exist and is Waters going to play them for us? And unlike Waters, I'm actually going to answer this question. No, he doesn't play them for us. And he doesn't show any of the bank records that supposedly exist either. And as of writing this, none of this evidence has come to light. We can't verify it. But what we're doing over here is called journalism. We're trying to verify it. We're connecting dots. The reason Waters opened this episode mocking other media outlets instead of reporting on the veracity of the claims made in the document is because, as he just said, his team hasn't been able to verify the claims made in the document either. But that won't stop him from using this unverified piece of information to advance a narrative. Jesse Waters claims to be a journalist, but he's not reporting any news here. The story, if there is one, is that this document was released publicly by Republicans for reasons that could easily be more political than a genuine attempt at investigating a crime. Republicans using political theater to attack their opponent isn't really newsworthy in my opinion, and any journalist reporting on it is in some way complicit in that theater unless they're pointing out what the Republicans are engaged in here. But Waters goes a step further by treating it true until proven false. It's the triumph of narrative over evidence once again. I mentioned the cocaine story earlier as a form of real news because even though it's less important than the president supposedly being blackmailed, the key difference here is that there's evidence that someone actually left cocaine in the White House and there's still no evidence anything in this form is in any way true. Now, I've been covering this Biden corruption story for a while now, and I can feel it's finally breaking through. What about you? This is how Waters wants his audience to understand the story. He wants them to feel like it's true. Not actually think it's true based on the evidence presented, just have that feeling it's true. This last section is a collection of some bad stuff I saw in this program that I honestly just don't know how to classify. The first are segments that were just advertisements for politicians dressed up as a news story and interview. On July 20th, we had a ridiculous interview with Ron DeSantis, where he was making a big deal of pulling the investments of the Florida Pension Fund out of Anheuser-Busch. This is in response to the value of the company going down, supposedly of the backlash to the advertising campaign featuring trans influencer Dylan Mulvaney. And by advertising campaign, I mean they sent Mulvaney a can of beer and they made a TikTok video about it. Middle class workers with pensions are seeing their portfolios implode. So Florida police officers, teachers, firefighters are witnessing their retirement funds collapse. Bud Light went woke 
and first responders went broke. This sounds pretty drastic. People are supposedly going broke because of this slide in the stock. Using the number Waters has given us, a drop in valuation of $16 billion since April, we can compare that to Anheuser Busch's current value of $116 billion on the date this episode was broadcast, July 20th. $16 billion out of the former value means Waters is counting this from when the company was valued at $132 billion on April 1st, so roughly a drop of 12%. Governor DeSantis gives us more information on how much of this drop affected Florida pensions. Well, we had over $50 million <clears throat> worth of InBev stock in the pension. Of course, Florida's pension fund's about $180 billion, so it's a pretty big uh, endeavor. So a loss of 12% of value from $50 million would mean a loss of $6 million out of $180 billion, or roughly 0.003% of the pension was lost because of wokeness. I think it makes it painfully clear how little an issue this is, and it's hardly worth the governor personally intervening. Though this is effective as PR to make DeSantis appear as some kind of warrior protecting the people of Florida from wokeness, lest they lose three thousandths of a percent of their pensions. We can see something similar in the July 19th episode where Ted Cruz was brought on so they can rage against the Barbie movie for supposedly including a map influenced by Chinese propaganda. If you see right here, next to Asia, shows the nine dashes. Now, those dashes signify Chinese ownership of the ocean islands and reefs. The Chinese believe they own the South China Sea, but they don't. So why did the Barbie movie bow to China? I should point out first that the map actually has eight dashes, not nine, and it's not drawing a border. Those dashes are actually Barbie's journey from Barbie land to the real world, at least according to a representative from Mattel. I actually haven't seen the movie. Also, I think it's pretty obvious that this map is not meant to accurately reflect the real world. It kind of looks like it was drawn by a child. When Cruz is interviewed, he reveals that he hasn't seen the movie, but he does have some new legislation ready to fight Chinese censorship. I introduced legislation, it's called the Script Act, that says the federal government will not allow uh, movie makers to use U.S. government assets, things like jets or tanks or ships or helicopters. Good if they allow the Chinese government to censor their films. U.S. Department of Defense already has immense influence over movies produced by big studios as it is. To get approval for using any U.S. military assets, like planes and tanks, potentially saving a production millions of dollars, scripts have to be approved by the U.S. Department of Defense. These approvals sometimes include suggestions to change movie scripts to more kindly reflect the actions of the U.S. military. Many movies, which studios are trying to reduce the budget of, will happily agree to these terms to get access to some of these valuable assets. Ted Cruz's legislation is just empowering this form of governmental oversight on film productions, making sure that a studio will have to avoid anything seemingly favorable to the Chinese government, bringing it more in line with the official position of the U.S. government. If the influence of China is considered censorship by refusing access to a market, this is just American censorship with a different incentive structure, refusing access to millions of dollars saved in production. All that said, I'm not sure how many movies this would apply to. Most movies featuring the military are already mostly pro-American, and those that aren't don't typically come out spouting Chinese propaganda. This really just seems like another publicity stunt to create the illusion of a politician passing legislation that will protect the people from Chinese censorship when, in reality, it's just a bunch of hollow posturing. There are another bunch of segments that I really don't know how to talk about aside from pointing out how silly they are, like the one about sharks. Watch out for sharks. Ah! Or alligators. The gator hopped right out of the water and chased him halfway home. Guy's lucky to be alive. And then there were the cocaine sharks. Bales of coke are now washing up in the oceans, and marine biologists are worried that sharks, yeah, are eating the coke. Oh, and sex robots. They will eliminate the need for real women. Do you believe that? And did you know that Joe Biden got new shoes? Joe Biden's wearing sneakers now. He's been rocking a no sock look too. What about the Amish? Did you know that they're healthy? A research foundation found that the Amish are the healthiest people in America. That last one isn't true, by the way. The Amish have a lot of health issues, specifically genetic disorders. Though the reason they bring on Steve Kirsch is to push some vague anti-vaccine nonsense. These stories, of course, are all tied to narratives as well. It's just hard to talk about every single one of them, because they're usually very minimal and deeply silly. 
Back in 2020, Fox News was sued over some comments Tucker Carlson made on his program about Karen McDougal. Fox News successfully defended Carlson by arguing that, and this is a quote from the judge's opinion, the general tenor of the show should then inform a viewer that Carlson is not stating actual facts about the topics he discusses and is instead engaging in exaggeration and non-literal commentary. This has been broadly understood to mean that Fox News' lawyers were arguing that no audience would ever believe Tucker Carlson was telling the truth about anything. The actual opinion is a bit more narrow, using details of the script to say that it should have been clear that Carlson's statements were, in that particular episode, and I'm quoting from the judge's opinion here, exaggeration, non-literal commentary, or simply bloviating for his audience. This speaks to how scripts on Fox News are written, and something that can be seen in the same work Jesse Waters does. One of the tougher things to nail down when covering Waters, or any of these more polished presenters, is that their scripts are put together with caveats and other rhetorical protections to protect them from being tied to the narratives they're so obviously pushing. They use questions and offer assumptions, though when you see the pattern of these questions and assumptions, they always point things in the same direction. It protects the hosts from the liability of making these claims while still advancing them in the minds of their viewers. To use a more controversial example, whenever someone has questions about a genocide, it only ever seems to be questions that suggest it wasn't as bad as people think or that it possibly never happened. The questions never seem to wonder that it might have been even worse or more widespread because these questions are searching for a specific answer. It's how you deny something horrible happened without actually saying it outright. You simply ask questions and let the audience answer them in their head. The assumptions are even more telling as leaps of logic are taken as facts, always moving toward the same conclusion. Here's a segment from July 27th that really show that in action. It starts off with a single piece of evidence, a statement from a supposed IRS whistleblower, and we're going to see how this program twists it. The IRS whistleblowers confirmed when I asked if they had documents pertaining to foreign accounts, and they said they did. So with regard to the Hunter Biden investigation, foreign accounts are a part of it. Now let's look at the speculation. With Joe... I suspect there are offshore accounts. Based on what Comer has said, he is speculating that the account or accounts belong to Joe Biden. Looking at his original statement, we don't even have confirmation that it belongs to any Biden, just that in this whole story, a foreign account or accounts were used. Then water starts to grow that speculation. IRS whistleblowers have indicated that they have documents suggesting that the Biden family, possibly Joe Biden himself, are hiding money offshore. Sources tell Primetime they have not seen the documents yet, but when they do, it goes through a vote, and then the documents will be released. Notice how that, even though he opens with speculation, he tempers all of that, kind of protecting himself when he says that we won't know any more details about these bank accounts, as they have to go through the House Ways and Means Committee to be approved for release first. But that doesn't stop him from building on that speculation with a series of questions. Why would Joe Biden receive money through shell companies from his son and... Why would Joe Biden have an offshore bank account? We don't even have evidence that this account or accounts belong to Joe Biden. But these questions make sense if you're willing to join Waters on this ride that just assumes that to be the case. And note how the questions all seem to be moving towards the same answer, that Joe Biden has some suspicious foreign bank accounts for a nefarious purpose. And then we get to the conclusion. Once you start zeroing in on foreign, foreign bank accounts, foreign lobbying, foreign agents, foreign business partners, foreign policy, foreign deals, that's fertile ground for impeachment. That's when you get into conspiracy, money laundering, even treason. And that's why this looks more and more like a bribery ring. So what we have here is bribery. And I'll remind you, this all started from the fact that someone said that this case involves foreign accounts, and that is morphed into Joe Biden is being bribed. This is how the assumptions made by Waters and the questions he asks move the audience towards specific conclusions that Joe Biden is involved in some kind of elaborate corruption and no real evidence of any of that is presented. It's all very circumstantial and speculative. Waters has proven that he can work in unison with Fox News more broadly, pushing narratives the channel finds useful. And unlike Tucker Carlson, he doesn't stray as obviously into the white nationalist talking points, aside from the one or two odd turns. Waters mostly stays in the realm of the mainstream right, and he would sooner spend the rest of his time complaining about infrastructure to attack anti-racism and not using stories of men tanning their balls to advance fascism. 
Waters, as a product of the Fox News system, is probably the perfect guy for the role he's in, and the few weeks we got of others trying out for the 8pm slot were probably to make sure he wasn't too obviously seen as Tucker Carlson's replacement, ensuring that the audience wouldn't turn on him right away. All Jesse Waters needs to do is keep his nose clean and not get into any trouble, and he can probably enjoy a long career telling the Fox News audience exactly what they want to hear, unless he runs his mouth and gets himself into trouble. When I was trying to get Emma to date me, uh, first thing I did, I uh, let the air out of her tires. She couldn't go anywhere. She needed a lift. I said, hey, you need a lift? She copped right does in the car. Does she know this story? No, she doesn't know this story. Does she watch the show? Now she does. Does she watch Jesse Credit to Juliet Jeske for popularizing that clip. Also, her publicly available research helped provide some additional context for Fox News more broadly while working on this video. Check out her stuff on Decoding Fox News if you get the chance. And for the record, in that clip, Jesse Waters has claimed that he was just joking. What absolutely isn't a joke is that at the time, Waters' future wife was working for him. And she's also the woman he cheated on his first wife with. So he seems like a lovely guy. It does make one think that his future might not be entirely dissimilar from his mentor, Bill O'Reilly. I guess we'll see what becomes of Waters and his dollar store David Schwimmer haircut. One thing I wanted to laugh at but didn't really know how to talk about in the video was the fact that at the end of every episode, Jesse Waters has a tagline where he says, I'm Jesse Waters and this is my world. From the look on his face when he does it, you can tell he's so proud he came up with it and it's also maybe one of the worst things I've ever heard. I don't know why you'd want your catchphrase to be modeled after one of the most famous box office bombs in history, but I would never accuse Jesse Waters of ever being clever. But if you think... I'm clever and would like to support me through some sort of financial means, you can become like all the lovely names you see floating up the screen now by joining my Patreon and supporting me there. You could also become a YouTube member if that's more convenient for you. If you haven't already, I also suggest you like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. If you don't know what to comment, why not share your favorite box office bomb? Extra points if you can somehow weave it into a clever sign-off, like... I'll be black in a flash. Thank you all so much for watching.